Walter Brueggemann is a world-renowned Old Testament scholar and a faithful voice crying in the wilderness of American Christianity. Last week, in connection with Thanksgiving, I quoted Brueggemann as saying that expressing hope in a society that lives in despair is one of the prophetic tasks of the church's witness. He actually names three such tasks. So I wanted to give you the full quote this morning. Brueggemann says, The prophetic tasks of the church are to tell the truth in a society that lives in illusion, to grieve in a society that practices denial, and express hope in a society that lives in despair. It's a powerful word for our time. And considering one of the tasks apart from the others seems neither adequate or appropriate, so I thought we'd spend the next couple of weeks starting today unpacking the other parts of this quote. I may even exercise my Baptist prerogative to add a fourth, because there is an important task, a fundamental task, in fact, that is missing from Brueggemann's list. But hey, nobody's perfect, right? Be that as it may, this is a list that, if taken seriously, can very much help us to stay grounded in and focused on what the Apostle Paul terms living a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called. But before we dive into these tasks, we should define what we mean by prophetic. It's a term that might prompt images of crystal balls or enigmatic oracles. The tradition of biblical prophecy, though, is actually not so much about predicting the future, but confronting the present, exposing the mirages of our age for what they truly are. The prophets of Israel call God's people to come to our senses, to change our ways, in a word, to repent. And to be sure, there are predictions of the future in the works of the prophets, but they largely concern the consequences that will result if we don't snap out of it, if we don't stop deluding ourselves now in the present. And these portents of doom are almost always accompanied by even buttressed with God's declaration, God's intention, God's promise to set things right, to heal, to restore, to transform, which is God's ultimate goal and ultimate purpose. God doesn't seek to rub our noses in our mess, but to set us on a better path. An example of this kind of prophetic witness is the story of the prophet Nathan and King David in 2 Samuel 12. It's perhaps one of the uh, more famous passages of the David story. The prophet Nathan comes to King David and tells him a story. There was a rich man who owned all these sheep. And there was also a poor man who had only one sheep. A sheep that he had raised from the time it was a baby It was more like a pet, a member of this man's family, than an animal in his barnyard. One day a guest comes, pays a visit to the rich man. But instead of sending his servants out to kill and to cook one of his many sheep, the rich man sends his servants to go take the one poor man's one sheep. kills it and roasts it and serves it to his guests. And when David hears the story, he's enraged. Show me this man. Show me this man who's done this horrible thing. There will be justice. And Nathan looks King David in the eye and says, you are the man. Because it actually wasn't a story about sheep. It was about 
David's murderous lust for Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of David's faithful generals. Confronting present realities is where we have to begin. And that is what these prophetic tasks named by Brigham and encourage, exhort, even implore us to do as the people of Jesus, to engage in practices that enable us to cut through the illusions and delusions of our time, including those that we ourselves cling to, to prepare the way for God's healing, restorative, and transformative work. And since we started last week at the end with expressing hope, I thought we'd work our way backwards. The last shall be first, right? Which brings us to grieve in a society that practices denial. Now, let's admit up front, grieving doesn't sound very fun or or fulfilling. It isn't. It's certainly not as resolute as expressing hope or as dignified as telling the truth. And we shouldn't pretend that it is. Grieving is never pleasant, but it is necessary. It is necessary if we are to find a better path to be instruments of God's hope and truth. If we are to be the kind of people that Jesus calls us to be, in Him, with Him, and for Him. And that's why before we protest too much, we need to hear Jesus tell us, reassure us, that those who grieve are blessed. A word that means happy as much as holy. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who grieve, for they shall be comforted. Now, I'm sure many of us still wonder how that could possibly be the case, even if Jesus does declare it. Well, here's my best crack at it. Mourning, grieving. It's blessed because grieving is an honest and truthful response to the painful and tragic realities of our world. When we grieve, it means that we are and have been engaged in this life. It's a sign that we have loved and have been loved, that we are involved and connected to the world around us, that we are able to see other people, whether we know them or not, as people just like us, made in the image of God just like us, not merely as categories or character types. When we grieve, it means that we recognize the brokenness and injustice and tragedy of our world for what they really are. It means that we're aware and we're alert. If we're not grieving, we're really not seeing. And if we're not really seeing, then we are practicing denial too, like much of the rest of our society either actively pretending that things aren't as they are, or passively, not even bothering to look. But either way, denial is denial, and denial is dangerous. It's destructive for the life that Jesus longs for us to have. Trouble is that denial is so very attractive. It's attractive because it protects us, it insulates us, it enables to block out and keep at bay things that we'd rather not think about or deal with. However, in shielding us, denial also disconnects us from others, from the world, even from God, and the possibility that things can be better. It insulates us from the notion that God wants and can and intends to make things better. That God wants and can and intends to use us, the church, to help make things better. That's the purpose that the prophets pushing God's people to snap out of it, to see through the mirages so God can lead us in a different direction toward truly life-giving oases 
so God can reform and transform us into a new people. And that's why I believe that Jesus calls those who mourn blessed. Because they are in touch and in tune with life in the world. And their grieving is the foundation upon which change can be built. Grief can be cathartic when we engage it, when we channel it into lament. And Scripture is full of lament. There's an entire book of the Old Testament called Lamentations that we've heard read from this morning. Likewise, the majority of the Psalms are, in fact, laments, some of them personal, some of them communal. All of it is verse, all of it is grief. But it's grief structured to be expressed and poured out rather than wallowed in. We can't be naive. Grief has to be handled carefully because it can overwhelm us. It can drown us even if we don't process it and channel it. And that's precisely what the Psalms of Lament and the poems contained in the Book of Lamentations set out to do. They give voice to the deep pain, to the bewilderment, to the betrayal, to the loss suffered by God's people, both individually and collectively, in a way that allows not only the psalmist and the poets to name their grief and cry out to God, but in a way that also asks God to receive it and receive them and move them through it. It's an expression that blesses not just them but others too. One reason why these poems have continued to be read for millennia is because God's people have found in their words expressions of what they themselves can't quite find the words to say. So when we speak of lament, of grief as a prophetic task, we're not simply talking about raw emotion, though holy lament certainly is full of that. But holy lament is a kiln that puts those flames to work, not a fire that's simply set free to rage unchecked. Prophetic holy lament isn't anger or blame or resentment, and it's not nostalgia for the way things used to be. It's an honest sorrow at what has befallen oneself, one's community, one's nation, one's world. A deep grief over a loss or an injustice. It's a reckoning, an acknowledgement that things are not as they should be. But it isn't mired and immovable. Listen again to part of what we heard read from Lamentations. How lonely the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. And they have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. There's two full chapters of this type of grief-stricken expression. But then we arrive... In chapter 3, the thought of my affliction and my homelessness is wormwood and gall. My soul continually thinks of it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy never comes to an end. There are new, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. 
O Lord, the Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in Him. These are words from Scripture that are the basis for a hymn that we still sing. And they come from the book of Lamentations. It takes a while to get there. This is no small or casual step. And it doesn't always hold indefinitely once we get there. Lamentations continues on for two more chapters after chapter 3. But the desire to make that leap is the reason the poet began to write, to pour out and name what needed to be named, to be unburdened in order to be carried across that chasm. And not just for the benefit of the, poem, of the poet himself or herself, but so others could be carried across as well. Perhaps one of the most famous modern day examples of this kind of lament is the song that I think was carried to the Elm Spring Nursing Home at our last service Sunday. I could be wrong about that, but I heard it being rehearsed. Tears in Heaven by Eric Clapton. It's a truly sad song, but it's a hopeful song. It was a song that Clapton wrote to process his grief over the loss of his four-year-old son, Connor, who tragically fell to his death from an apartment window in New York City in 1991. Now, Eric Clapton didn't just wake up the next day and write this song. It was months and months and months before he was able to process his grief in this way, but as a musician, he knew he had to process it. He also knew he couldn't do it by himself, so he enlisted the help of another songwriter, Will Jennings, to help him finish the verses. But it's a song that helped him through, and it's a song that's helped many others, perhaps even thousands of others, also carry themselves through the chasm of grief because Eric Clapton was able to find words to express what so often so many of us have a hard time finding the words to express. It's a sad song, but it's a hopeful song. And I think that's why it endures, even though Eric Clapton doesn't play it anymore because it helped him get through that grief. And he doesn't intend to go back. Now let me be clear. This kind of prophetic lament takes a variety of forms. Don't think you have to be a poet or a musician to engage in this work of grieving in a holy, purposeful way. You don't even necessarily have to be a particularly holy person. Prophetic lament might even be able to take the form of comedy. Comedian Chelsea Handler has a documentary on Netflix entitled, Hello Privilege, It's Me, Chelsea. I haven't seen it. I don't know if it's funny or helpful. But even if it bombs... The concept behind it is earnest, and sometimes comedians can help us see things that we need to see in ways that we don't allow other people to allow us to see. This project came out of reflection that Chelsea did on an experience she had when she was a teenager, and if you don't know who Chelsea Handler is, she's, um, she's a young, white, blonde comic. She says, I'm about as white as they come. And when she was a teenager, she for a time lived with a boyfriend and his family who happened to be black. And they got into trouble with drugs. And three times, she and her boyfriend got caught 
with, with weed by the police, small amounts of weed. And each time, the police told her to go home, and they arrested him. Same offense, same time, same place. She was told to go home, he was arrested. And as a result of these arrests, he lost a scholarship to college. It became an inconvenience for her. It was a life-altering tragedy for him. And at the time, she didn't process or understand or see the racism inherent in this action for what it was. And that's what she's made this documentary about. And I hope it works. Because these are the kinds of unjust, painful, tragic things that we need to see and acknowledge and grieve. Honesty really is the key. Honesty paired with empathy, a willingness to look carefully, openly, and clearly at the state of ourselves and the state of our world and be moved by what we see. So that God might move us, might carry us forward. It's not fun. It's not easy. But this kind of prophetic grief is important work because it connects us both to hope and to truth-telling. And it has the power to help us be more fully the people that Jesus calls us to be. So in this time of silence that follows the sermon here at Kingsway, today I want to encourage you to ask yourself, what do I grieve? Or perhaps, what do I resist grieving? Because I really don't want to go there. I don't want to deal with that. Spend some time taking that question to God because that grief might very well be the launching pad for the healing and transformation that not only you long to see, but that all of us long to see and experience. Blessed are those who mourn. Thanks be to God. Amen.